Praise God. I think, come on. Hallelujah. It's a good time to be alive, isn't it? Yes. Amen. Wow. Hallelujah. What a great time of worship. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. He is worthy of all our praise. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just bear with me a minute. And I'll find myself. I'd like us just to turn to Ephesians 2. Verse 8. I'm just going to pray. Father, just thank you, Lord, for the privilege, Lord, of being able to stand here this morning, Lord. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you will just speak. Lord, that you'll speak to me. That you'll speak to the congregation, Father, Lord. That you'll just give us your word for the season that we're in right now, Lord. And Lord, that we will be encouraged, Lord, Father, that those dreams that you've planted on the innermost parts of our hearts will rise up, Lord, and flourish in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So God has ordained us and he has created us for good works. We can't boast that it's anything of ourselves and our own strength. It is all about Jesus. I just want us to turn to Matthew. Verse 5, chapter 13. It says there, and it'll say it in red in most Bibles, and that means that Jesus is speaking. And when Jesus speaks, it's worth listening to. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is then for good for nothing but is cast out and trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and they giveth, it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that you may, they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. I've taken a prop from home today. I'm hoping Mandy won't uh, realise. It's quite a clever candle. We don't have naked flames in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Anymore. Anymore, for certain reasons. So with the magic of technology, I can switch that candle on. It's quite effective and it's real wax as well. And uh, it's safe. Praise God. But the Lord uses us and uses the example that we are candlesticks. And he says that when we become born again, we become light. Now, at work I've got a light that I use, especially now the weather's changing, it's getting darker and it's a halogen lamp and it's very powerful and it, it shines through quite well. Obviously this morning that light is surrounded by a lot of light. If we turn the lights off, David, David is the light man. <laughs> that little light becomes brighter, doesn't it? We can see that light more in the darkness now 
the when all the lights on. So you can put the lights back on, David, or I won't be able to read. <laughs> but the Lord says that we are a candlestick. But he also says, I've not called you to be light, to put your light under a bucket or a basket. I've called you to shine and be that light. I think after years of ministry, and obviously we know that one day the Lord's coming. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist this morning to realise that God's word is coming to pass in the world. If you read Matthew, it talks about wars and rumours of wars and earthquakes in diverse places and famines. I would say now we are pretty much seeing that more than ever. And when you look at the world and the mess it's in, it's a dark place. But that's good for the church. Because the darker the world gets, the brighter the church shines. You see, because the Lord has created us to shine and be light. That's what the word says. A lot of times we look at different people in the church or different ministries and we would probably consider wow you know they're amazing they're fantastic but the Lord just says shine and that candle gives off light and it makes a way and if you was in a really dark cave sometimes we got to uh, Matlock or to Abraham's Heights if anyone's been there and you can go underground into the caves and they do a bit of a show and it's pitch black and they show you how the miners used to mine underground from a little candlestick and you wouldn't believe what these people worked in. But when you turn all the lights off in a really dark place and you just put that one little candle in, it shone enough for them to be able to work and mine underground. So we have an important part to play in the body of Christ, don't we? As much in the church as outside the church. You see, the body of Christ is important that we all function and we move in a body because we are a team of people in the body of Christ with different gifts and different callings. But every single one of us make an impact on the body of Christ and from the church and the body of Christ, we make an impact in the world. And you know, the Lord doesn't talk about being the greatest impact or the lesser impact. He just talks about making an impact, touching lives, sharing the love of God. If you go to John 6, verse 1 to 14, you haven't got to turn to it. It talks about Jesus uh, and speaking to the 5,000. And whenever you hear of anybody preach and minister, it's always about the wonderful miracle that Christ did with the five loaves and the two fishes, and fed 5,000 people. Not very often do you hear the, law, the people minister about the young boy whose loaves and fish they were. And I was just thinking about this young boy, and I was just thinking, you know, I know what I'm like when I'm hungry. My wife always says to me, caring is sharing, and sometimes when I'm hungry I don't want to share. I don't know if you've ever been out for a meal uh, and you go to a restaurant, uh, we'll eat uh, a meal and then uh, it'll come to sweet time or pudding as some people want to call it. And uh, my favourite uh, pudding is trifle. I know you can't tell. <laughs> but I do like a trifle. And I'll say to Mandy, are you having a sweet love? And she'll go, oh no. I couldn't possibly eat anything else after that meal. Makes me feel a little bit guilty, but not enough that I will not have that trifle. <laughs> so the waitress will come, and I'll order the trifle, and the trifle will come, and it'll land on the table. And then all of a sudden, a little voice will chirp up to the waitress, have you got another spoon? <laughs> At that stage... I look at Mandy in a little bit of disgust and say, you're having a laugh. 
You're not having any of my trifle. If you want a sweet, I'll get you your own trifle. Waitress, forget that second spoon. I've done that a couple of times. Now, I'm not mean. I'm quite willing to buy her another trifle. But then Mandy will say, yes, but I can't manage a whole trifle to myself. Hey, this cake away. Put it in a box. Take it home. But, you know, my trifle means a lot to me. <laughs> Let's go back to the young boy. They've been sitting there all day, it says. It's warm. The evening's come on. And all of a sudden, out of the 5,000, there's not many bright people there. You'd think if he was going to listen to everybody, if we was going on to Cannock Chase and it was a bring and share, you'd bring a sausage roll, wouldn't you? Or you'd bring something with you to eat because it's going to be a long day. There's not a McDonald's around the corner. There's not a Tesco Express. You're sitting in there listening to Jesus speak. Evening's coming and they're all getting a little bit peckish. Somebody's obviously told them that the disciples were going to be fired lunch, but obviously no one had fed that through to the disciples, and now they were coming to Jesus. This young boy sitting there with his five loaves and his two fishes, and the disciples walk around and see this. This young boy had a decision to make. He could have, like me, gone, you're having a laugh. <laughs> my mum's made me these, and they're my favourite. I like these fish and I like these rolls. Go and get your own food. I'm having these. They're mine. Whether in them times they could have done anything about it, I don't know. They could have probably given the lad an asbo and told him, sorry, tough, we're having them anyway. There's 5,000 here and there's one of you. Do you want to fight for it? <laughs> but this young man, as far as we know, willingly gave up his lunch. Probably thinking... This is going to be interesting. At the most, this will probably feed 10 people, if we take little pieces. But there's no way on this planet it's going to feed 5,000. So this could be a laugh. Let's see what the disciples are going to do with this. So he obviously hands it over to them, not really probably understanding the impact of this one di unselfish decision that he was going to make was going to feed 5,000 people. No, we know, almighty God, he didn't need the little boy, really, or the young lad, because he could have called manna from heaven, if need be. They'd done this before in the Old Testament, why not now? But Jesus knew that this young man was there. They, they used the opportunity and the young man was willing to be used and to give unselfishly of what he got. And out of that, we saw a great reward. And I think there's an awesome story in that, that through one unselfish act of giving, touched thousands. He probably thought it was quite a small thing. But what a change it would have made to them people. I wonder when they got the 12 baskets left over, whether they came over to the boy and said, have some of these baskets and take it home to your family. He would have received more back than he'd ever given out. And God does that with us as people. You know, you can never ever outgive God. You'll never ever be able to outgive Him because as much as you pour out, He'll always give you back a hundredfold. If you're giving it out of the right heart and the right motive, God rewards us. You may be in a position in the church, in a different area of the church, and I've ministered this before. The Lord doesn't grade us in rank, we are the church. And we all have a part to play. We all impact in different areas of our life and in different areas of the church. And every area is important as the other. Praise God. Mm -hmm. In church as a body of people, really, we should never really be hankering after position and thinking that we've achieved something greater. The heart of a child of God is to serve and to see God touch people's lives. There was a man called Edward Kimball. He was a dry goods salesman in the 19th century. And I was just reading up the other day about different things. And uh, Edward Kimball, some of you may have heard of, but he was just a dry goods salesman. 
He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a teacher. Well, he was a bit of a teacher, actually. He was a Sunday school teacher in his spare time from doing his job of being a salesman and going around places selling material. He was teaching a young group of people in the church on a Sunday morning at Sunday school. And a young man who he felt really burdened for, called Dwight, who worked in a shoe shop in the town where he lived, he went to see when he was working. He felt God call him to go into the shoe shop and speak to this young man, and he felt really burdened for him for the salvation that he needed in his life. He stood outside the shop, a bit nervous of wondering what the reaction would be, but decided that God had called him to do this, and in a small way, he felt that he'd got to go in and speak to this young man and tell him about Christ. How much he loved him and how much God wanted Dwight to love him back. So he went into the shop and said to the young man, who was part of the Sunday school team, went in there and said to him, I'd like to speak to you. Is there any way we can talk? And they went into the back storeroom and he started speaking to him about the love of God and how much he loved him. That day, Dwight gave his life to Christ. We know from history that Dwight actually was more known as D.L. Moody, one of the greatest evangelists in the 19th century that travelled from America to the UK, preaching the gospel and saw thousands come to Christ. We hear a lot about D.L. Moody, but probably don't hear about the Edward Kimball. But that young, one man's obedience to God in going into a shoe shop in his work time as a salesman to share the gospel and the love of Christ changed the young man's life to the fact that he would become one of the greatest evangelists in the 19th century. How awesome is that? That's impacting somebody's life. Henrietta Mears, in 1928, God had placed on her heart for education. She was a math, uh, the daughter of a Methodist. We can't hold that against her. And she felt really a desire to be educated in the things of God and to go further on, but suffered in her life with ill health and was told that if she kept studying as she was studying, that she would lose her sight at the age of 30 years old. Her reaction to that was, I would rather be educated and blind than blind and uneducated. I would rather be able to share what I've learned than not be able to share. She went to a Sunday school in Hollywood, part of a Presbyterian church, with a Sunday school of 400 people, children, and shared what she'd been taught and educated and preached and shared the life of Christ in that place. The Sunday school grew, grew, grew from 400 to nearly 6,000, the network of Sunday schools that she'd started. One of the children that was in that Sunday school was Billy Graham. She impacted his life that much that he gave his life to Christ. And as we know, Billy Graham became one of the great evangelists of our time. We don't hear much about Henrietta Mears, but she played a vital part in bringing another person to Christ. The title today is Impact. You see, you may feel that you play a small part in the body of Christ. You may feel that you play a small part outside. When you're out at work and when you're doing your daily chores. But you see, if you get one candle and you touch it against a candle that's not lit, it will light. We are the life of Christ and he lives on the inside of us. So that life that now lives in us can now live in others. You see, it's not about coming to church on a Sunday. And we walk through the double doors and switch my candle on. 
Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb. It's time to go now. Dinner time. Brilliant. Oh, we have got a bit of a prayer meeting on a Tuesday. Hang on a minute. It's Friday now. It's time to go down the pub. That's not what it's about. It's lit and shining continually because it's the life of God. And the Lord wants us to be bold because he's given us the power of God on the inside of us. I'm going to share a little testimony. A couple of weeks ago, I can't think of the guy's name now, that preached, and he preached about not blaming ourselves. Things don't happen to us because we've been bad. Knowing the Father's heart, that was it, and how much the Father loves us. And uh, just a really encouraging word. Because there's a lot of people that feel that their Christian walk is dependent on how good they are. And if we do something wrong, we're going to get punished. And then something goes wrong. Perhaps you've got a worse, burst water pipe in your house or you've got a puncher on the way to work in the morning and you're sitting in your car going, oh Lord, what have I done? Why has this happened to me? No, you've just driven over a nail. <laughs> but people still beat themselves up over that. They don't know the Father's love. We went to see Mandy's mum after church that Sunday because she'd had a fall. This is her third fall in six months. And when she falls, bless her, she doesn't do it half-heartedly. She hits the ground. Black up face, bruised, really, you know. And Mandy's going, what on earth is up with you? Why do you keep falling over? You know. And... Uh, Bless her, she's 77. She's not a young spring chicken. And she'd been to the hospital all day on the Saturday and uh, they'd done x-rays and all these different things and they said to her, look, you've broke your wrist. It's going to have to go into plaster. She said, look, I've got arthritis in my fingers and that. I can't have it in a plaster. I need a splint or something. The pain will be agonising. So they said, well, look, we'll put it in a sprint for now. You need to come back on the Tuesday and you need to, we need to re-X-ray and we need to look what we can do because if it's bad enough, you know, you may have to still have it in a plaster. We went round on the Sunday and, and we were just talking and chatting and she was just sharing about, you know, she says, oh, I've just been asking the Lord why this keeps happening. Have I done something wrong? And it just stirred something in my heart after the ministry that we'd heard that Sunday morning. And I said, the Lord says, if we ask for bread, he won't give us a stone. If our heavenly father knows how to give us good gifts, how much more so? If a normal father knows how to give us good gifts, how much more so our heavenly father? I said, the Lord hasn't afflicted you because you've done something wrong. You've fallen over. It's as simple as that. But, I said, I really feel that we need to pray for a miracle. And I got Mandy and we knelt down. And as I was praying, the scripture kept going through my head about Jesus when he went to the cross. And it speaks in the Old Testament that there will be no bones broken. So I prayed for her and I said, Lord, I just declare we want a miracle over this wrist. I just ask that you will knit it together right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And that no bone will be broken. Just bring it together and knit it. And we just pray for healing for her. We got a text on the Tuesday morning. She'd gone to hospital. They re-x-rayed it. And there was no sign of a break. That is the power of God. She wasn't in church. We didn't sing four songs to bring the Holy Spirit down. We didn't have to whip up an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to work. It was just that point and that moment in time where the Lord stirred up something in a conservatory and said, do it now. And the Lord did it. There was no congregation looking on, shouting, hallelujah, praise the Lord. There was just me, Mandy, and her mom. 
and God moved and I came out and when I heard the testimony I was like wow man the amount of people in church are prayed for but God says that was the appointment that was the time that was the time to make the impact it was that revelation that the heavenly father loves her that much that that was what he was going to do so it's not what about what we do in church on a Sunday it's what we do when we're outside of church you see because the life of Christ is on the inside of us and God has called us to impact a world and impact a nation and you know it doesn't matter how small or insignificant you think that thing is that you're doing it impacts we've got committed people that serve in champions, that teach our young children out the back there. I think we're up to four teachers now. We could do with six. But they willingly, digitally teach in there on a rotor every Sunday and they teach our children. One of them children may be the next Billy Graham. One of them children may be the new D.L. Moody. One of them children might be the contact point for God to bring revival into Rugeley. We don't know. But God does. But through their faithfulness in teaching, and I honour them, every single one of them, in the name of Jesus, for their diligence in what they do, they're touching a generation. You know, it was awesome last Sunday to see a generation of young people leading us and ministering and speaking and you could see a generation of church rising up Jane and Michael doing an awesome job with the young people the, the, the generation up from our children putting hours and hours serving and impacting people's lives that probably when I look at some of them I, I've been here on meetings sometimes I see them come through them doors and I think wow man I wonder sometimes whether I would have the patience or whether I'd want to flick their ears. But they've had the patience and the diligence to serve and import into these young people's lives. They could be the next evangelist that will touch nations. They could be the next missionary that will change nations around the world. God knows. Steve with the men's work. Dawn with the women's work. All the different things that go on. And you may think, sometimes you may feel really tired. Sometimes you may think, why do I bother? You may lead the worship team and you may sing there and you may be up the front sometimes just worshipping God and then you look out and you see people's faces. And you think, why? Why do I come every Friday and practice? And sometimes, like Will says, you need to put a coat hanger in your face. And smile. But you know, but they're doing it unto God. And whatever we do is unto Christ. And whatever we do impacts and changes people's lives. Sometimes we may never even know the impact when we've bumped into somebody on the street and either prayed for them or spoke to them. We may never ever see them again. But on that day when we stand before God, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Here's your reward. You see, all the things we've done, God's going to reward you for being diligent and serving. And we're all going to be rewarded for what we've done, served in Christ. So this morning I encourage you that whatever part you play, be encouraged that God is saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. It blessed me to hear Sam's testimony the other day when he was sharing about people that had impacted his life. And he was thanking them. At that time, I dare say, they probably, people never realised how much they were impacting him. But they impacted his life. So this morning, wherever you are, you need to realise... 
that you are vital to this world and to the church. You're vital no matter what part you play. I believe a wind's blowing through the churches now and God may be saying to you and stirring up your heart that perhaps he wants to move you into a different area. He may want you to, actually you perhaps you're doing nothing and he wants you to do something else. Perhaps you have got a heart to speak in champions. Perhaps you've got a heart to help with youth. Perhaps you've got a heart to help well, with the men or the ladies. Ask the Lord. Ask him in the body where he wants you to serve. And when you go out every day to your job or when you're in the town, ask the Lord, Lord, today, who do you want me to touch? Who do you want me to shine to? Who would you like me to speak to, Lord? Because this morning, Lord, I'm not too busy. I'm available for you to move through. And I want to shine like you say to shine. I don't want to hide my light. I want people to declare and say that you are God. Amen. Amen. I just want to show a short video. And then I'm going to wind up. If you can just flick the lights for me again, David, thank you. <laughs> Keep you fit, mate. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Be available. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Home, just ask someone to pray with you if you just feel that need. And believe God will touch your heart and touch your life. Praise Him. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you.